lie-based visual tape, solar films. Okay? So um, I'm going to tell you a story today about these sorts of films okay, that are made up of organic dye molecules that are sitting in plastic. And there are a number of reasons why these are a very cool way to be able to make uh, solar cells. Uh, it's really cheap to make them. They're made out of materials um, that are, are, are uh, abundant. Okay? Uh, they're, um, they're very flexible in terms of what color of light you can actually harvest uh, using them. And they're also very flexible in the sense that you can make them into very thin films that can be printed. Uh, so it's easy to scale up uh, the process of making these devices. Okay? And like I said, what's super cool about them is that they're made out of molecules like these right here. Okay? So basically, the building blocks uh, of all of those materials that are going into something that's already been deployed you know, on the streets of San Francisco uh, are molecules like these. <clears throat> okay? So I know this is the physics department, so I should be careful about uh, you know, the intricacy of molecules. Um, that I show people, but uh, a lot of you have probably taken a chemistry course much more recently than I have. Okay, so these are some of my favorite examples of molecules that are used uh, to make these sort of films, and the ones that I'll talk about most today are pentacene, which is this guy right here, and this other form of pentacene that has these things hanging off of it, which make it soluble so that you can actually print films of it. Okay, the thing that's really exciting about these materials is that unlike something like silicon, uh, when you make your uh, solar cell or organic materials like this, they can uh, capture the light, so they can absorb light, but they can also transmit energy in a very interesting fashion. Okay, so we're going to talk about that interesting fashion in just a moment, because it's really at the core of the work that we're, we're doing in my lab. Okay, so before we get too deep into that, I just want to kind of like you know, like lay down the foundation uh, and tell you what a solar cell really is. Okay, so basically we want light to go into this device. We want electrical power to come out. Okay, so generally when you want power to come out, you need to have two electrodes. So there's an electrode down here and an electrode up here. And this green and orange stuff in between, uh, these are the materials that are doing the light absorbing and they're the materials that are somehow uh, converting this light energy uh, into uh, charges uh, that flow into this top and bottom electrode. Okay? So I want to talk about what goes on in this orange and green stuff right here, sorry, right here this donor and this acceptor material, in a little bit more detail. Uh, but this is the general principle in just about all uh, solar cells. Um, we're converting to useful electrical work uh, through this process that's initiated by light absorption. So let's focus on this region, this green and orange stuff right here, and you'll see shortly why I call one of the materials a donor material, one of the materials an exception material. Okay, so the first step in this process that involves a series uh, of different steps um, is the one that you're probably most familiar with, and that's photo excitation. Okay, so that's not specific to these particular materials, it's something that happens in just about anything that absorbs light. Okay? So you have a uh, photon that comes in and it excites an electron. Okay? So I'm indicating my electron with this like, little blue dot here. Um, so the electron is basically taking up the energy that was in the photon initially, um, but it's not quite as simple as that. So once this electron is excited, once it has more energy, it's in this higher energy state, kind of left behind this void where there's less negative charge. Okay? We call that a hole. Okay, so we have this electron that can kind of move around now that it has enough energy to move around, move around in space. Um, but because the hole has this effective positive charge and the electron has certainly got a negative charge, they're attracted to one another. Okay? So they're attracted to one another enough that they want to kind of travel around together. Okay? So this species that uh, is this electron bound to this hole, we typically call that an exciton. Okay? So it's this particular type of photo excitation, and these materials that I've indicated, these guys are hanging out together uh, with a dashed line that surrounds them. Okay? So we're going to talk today about how excitons move in these materials, and that's the next step in the process of solar energy conversion. Okay, so the next thing that happens is that somehow this exciton can migrate 
uh, through this material. And it can actually migrate over fairly long distances, at least compared to the size of the lepton. Um, and it migrates, or at least what we want it to do, migrate to this interface between this orange stuff and this green stuff here. This orange stuff and this green stuff are basically two examples of different semiconductors. You can think of these materials as being semiconductors, albeit organic ones. Uh, and at this material, the whole, or at this interface, the whole point is that it becomes energetically favorable for the electron and the whole to separate from one another. Okay, so the next step uh, in this process uh, is that you kind of pull apart the exciton and all of a sudden the negative part, so the electron, shows up in this green stuff, which is the uh, acceptor. Okay, so the green stuff is accepting the electron and then um, this orange material down here is the donor. Okay, so now maybe those names make a little bit more sense. Okay, so that's the process that we call charge separation. And then the final thing that has to happen is for these charges that have been separated from one another uh, to migrate to the electrodes, okay, where you can collect them uh, and drive a photo Okay, so this is basically, I'm at least depicting it right now, is this four-step process uh, where we start with photo excitation and by the end we're generating a current. Okay? And what's really important about these four steps is that each of them is extremely important. Uh, each of them isn't going to be 100% guaranteed. Okay? There's going to be an efficiency for each of these processes. Okay? And there are going to be inefficiencies involved as well. Uh, and this is something that's really important because to make the best solar cell that we can make, we need to make it as efficient as possible. And we want to be able to understand what makes it efficient. Uh, so basically, you have to multiply the efficiencies for all of these different things to happen uh, together in order to figure out what the sum total efficiency is. I guess I should say the products total. Okay. Uh, so the process that we're most interested in my group is this process here of exciton migration, the second <coughs> And this is really important, especially in organic materials, because in these materials, the exotons can travel uh, tens of nanometers um, without uh, any sort of deleterious effects occurring. And this is very different than what you have in, say, silicon or germanium. Um, so that's something that's very particular to these, and it's kind of an extra way to boost the efficiency uh, of these organic solar cells. Okay? And one of the ways that they do this is by doing it fast. Okay, so the exotons, when they kind of search around looking for this interface, um, they do it in a matter of picoseconds. Okay, so that's let me see, that's 10 to the minus 12 seconds, right? Okay, so it's pretty darn fast. So to look at it happening, you also have to do something really cool too. Okay, <clears throat> so the reason it has to happen fast is because you're basically sending these excitations. Exotons through some sort of obstacle course uh, where <coughs> if they don't get to the interface uh, before the time is up, they don't get there at all. Okay, so I guess that would be true no matter what. <laughs> um, the idea being that there are all sorts of other things that could happen. So along the way, uh, the electron in the hole could get too close and then recombine. Okay, and if they recombine, then you get fluorescence and your energy goes out into light. Okay, that's one thing that could happen. They could convert to heat and just heat up the material. Okay? They could get trapped at some uh, abnormality in the structure of the material and hid there so that they can't move anymore. Uh, so there are a whole series of different ways um, that um, you can create an obstacle course for these excitations. And we, we want to make sure that that obstacle course is as minimal as possible. But ultimately, we just want to study what that obstacle course looks like. Okay, so in order to have an efficient solar cell, you need to make sure that the travel of these exotons is outcompeting the time scales for all these other events to happen. Okay, so keep that in mind, uh, and we'll come back to it a little bit later in the talk. Okay, so here's the picture I was showing you before when we were talking about this exoton migration. And the one other thing that's kind of key here, um, that where I've been kind of pulling the wool over your eyes so far, is that I've drawn this material here as this nice orange smooth thing. Okay, it looks really uniform, but in reality it's not. Okay, so it has some sort of structure to it. It has some sort of substructure. Okay, it may not be completely homogeneous, as indicated by all these sort of nubbles and things um, that are showing up here. They might be different uh, for different materials. Okay, this substructure is really important because it's going to have an influence on the efficiency of 
migrating uh, exotons. Okay, so all those processes uh, that we talked about um, just a moment ago may depend very heavily on the structure of the material. So we're going to need to somehow figure out how the structure of the material at multiple different length scales is correlated to the way that this exoton migration can happen uh, and to how easily it can happen to the efficiency for the process. Okay, so that's really the reason why I wanted to call this talk something about going surfing uh, with these electronic excitations. You can see that the molecular materials that we're talking about are basically these materials that are made out of somehow packing together a bunch of organic molecules. Uh, and these electronic excitations are these excitons right here. Okay, so what I want to do now is kind of zoom in and look at the sort of substructure that we expect to be present. And then we'll talk about how um, that particular structure enables excitations to move around in the material in the first place. Okay, so if we start zooming in here, um, if we look, say, at some particular region within this film here, uh, you can take a picture of it, and it might look something like this. Okay, so this is a polarized optical microscope image of a film that my student Ben made. Okay, and you can see it looks very beautiful. It has, has all these different colors. And the sort of length scale here, I think this is kind of like tens of microns across. The different colors that you see correspond to different sort of domains <coughs> of the film. Okay? Uh, and when I say domain, I basically mean some sort of region where there's border. So in this particular case, if you look at this purple domain right here, you might have this sort of packing, this crystallinity of a whole series of pentacene molecules, in this case, um, that are arranged in this particular configuration. That might be the sort of structure within this purple domain right here. But then if I move over and I look at this peach colored domain right here, um, I might have uh, the same sort of crystal, or maybe even a different one, but where the orientation is different. Okay? So basically there's order on the scale of each of these uniform colors that you see in this picture, um, but you have all these different colors. And the different colors uh, arise from the fact that polarized light interacts uh, differently with uh, material uh, that's oriented in, say, one direction, like this, or in another direction, like that. Okay? So basically, if you zoom in, you've got a whole bunch of these different crystalline domains within the material, and somehow the organization of all of these molecules uh, has to facilitate First, the fact that there are exotons, and also the fact that these exotons can be different. Okay, so let's figure out a little bit more about how that works. Okay, so here is a single one of these molecules. So this is one of our pentacene molecules right here. Uh, and a nice way to be able to think about this molecule all by itself is as follows. Um, before light comes in, uh, it's in its ground state. Okay, and if a photon is absorbed by this molecule, then the electron is promoted to some excited state that we did today right here. Okay, so once that happens, you've generated uh, some sort of excitation, and it has a transition dipole moment. Um, you guys know that it's pointing in this direction. These guys are the class. Okay, so it has a transition dipole moment along this axis, which basically means um, that if I send an electric field in that's oscillating in this direction, I can make an electron cloud where the electron density in the molecule oscillate uh, in that same way, okay? So that's a good thing. What becomes really interesting is what happens if we bring in another molecule and stick it really close by, like the ones that are next to one another in uh, the crystals we were just looking at. Okay, so say we do that. So this molecule also has a dipole moment, it has its own excited state. Um, but if you think about it, here you've got some distribution of positive charge where there are a bunch of nuclei, and then uh, you have a bunch of uh, electron density, uh, and the same thing is true here, and there are going to be Coulomb forces, uh, or Coulomb interactions between these two molecules, where if you really wanted to calculate them, you would have to figure out you know, all the different elements of <coughs> positive and negative charge that will be along this molecule and will be along that one, and kind of sum up the interaction the Coulomb interactions in either case. Okay, so that in some sense is the way that we can generate these exotons and allow them to move, and I'll show you how this works in just a sec. Okay, so if I went to like 
different molecules, okay? And these states here are really our excess ions, okay? So basically, if you take the quantum mechanics already, you can think of this as being generated by a Hamiltonian that has optic diagonal elements that have to do with this Coulomb interaction. If you haven't taken quantum mechanics yet, that's totally fine. Hope you will still be able to understand everything I say to you for the rest of the afternoon. Um, but it should be an incentive, right? <laughs> so, so the idea is that if you look at these exotons in space, like what do their wave functions look like, right? Um, then the wave function doesn't look like this blob, but it really is delocalized over these two molecules. Okay, so if you have atomic wave functions, so you have some idea of what those things look like, the electron cloud for an atom. Then if you put atoms together to make molecules, then you get the orbitals for these molecules. And now what I'm saying is that if you stick molecules close enough together, uh, then the wave functions for the electrons on these molecules span across more than one molecule. Okay? And if you think about what happens now if you make a crystal, okay, so where you have not two of these, but many of them, in that case, uh, it's kind of like um, delocalized electrons on steroids. I don't know if you say that. No steroids. <laughs> but here, if you look at what happens if we have this sort of crystal of these very same molecules here, which is uh, emanating from this uh, one homogeneous region of my film. In this particular case, if you try and figure out um, how exotons should be in this material, you might find that you can have an exoton that's kind of spread out over this region here, or this region here, or this region here. By virtue of the fact that there's some sort of orange stuff everywhere around here, that you can imagine that once you make an exoton, say, <coughs> show up right here by illuminating the system of light, that it can migrate. Okay? It can migrate from one of these locations to another. Okay? It can make its way over a fairly long uh, distance across this entire crystal region. Okay? And this is very cool. This is not something that can happen in just any material. And this is one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be studying these things. In fact, just by the way, it happens in photosynthesis too. This is what happens with all the orbital molecules in photosynthesis. And that's another one of the problems that I'm really interested in studying as well. Okay, so this is what happens, you know, I've shown you how the exoton could maybe make it to the other end of this crystalline region, but then we have to ask the question of, okay, well, say we're looking over multiple regions, so multiple different domains, what would happen then? Okay, so basically, is this possible? Is it possible at the sort of region where the molecules are oriented in one way in one domain and in another way in another domain to still have an exoton move over from one domain to the other? Okay? And this is kind of an outstanding question. I mean, I think it is possible in principle, but based on these sorts of interactions that uh, occur between the molecules, it really depends on how they're oriented with respect to one another and how far or close they are. Okay, so there's a lot of unknowns here. These are some of the unknowns that we'd really like to be able to answer in our research. Okay, so basically, um, is the sort of migration process here the same as the migration process here? What happens in between these regions? And ultimately, how is this affecting the efficiency of solar cells? Okay, so if you wanted to measure this, what would you do? Um, well, I'll tell you first what people have been doing so far, and then I'll tell you uh, what I think is so cool about what we're going to do instead. Okay, so um, the idea uh, is that normally people want to measure what we talk about as photophysics. Okay, so basically what happens when you shine light on something? Um, what happens to the exotons? Uh, where are the exotons, both in terms of energy and in terms of space? Uh, so typically people do what's called a pump probe measurement. Okay, and this involves ultra-fast laser light. Uh, so basically, pulses of laser light that are, say, tens of femtoseconds long uh, in that particular case. And the experiment kind of goes like this. So you have your sample, so you can think of this as a film right here. And we send two light pulses in. The first one I'm showing you in blue, okay, right here, this we call our pump pulse. So the pump pulse is is basically at some very well defined instant of time, uh, it excites uh, the molecules in your film where it generates exotons, okay? Then we have the control to be able to send in a probe pulse at some well-defined time delay after the pump, okay? And the probe's job is to basically figure out what happened 
to this sample, to this film, as a result of the pump. Okay, so it basically looks at the impact of the pump. But there can be a lot going on. Okay, so just because you make a bunch of exosomes doesn't mean they sit still. Okay, all of those different types of decay processes that we talked about, recombination and fluorescence, or like generation of heat, all that stuff can happen. Uh, that's all part of the photophysics of the system that you're studying. Uh, and of course, the exotons can migrate away. Um, so we want to somehow use this sort of measurement in order to probe those sorts of things. And generally, what your data looks like when you do this sort of uh, measurement uh, is like this. Okay, you have some sort of trace. It starts around zero. And as a function of time, first your signal goes to some peak value, and then it decays. Okay? Uh, and the signatures of all those different photophysical processes that we've been talking about um, basically determine both the amplitude here and the decay time um, of this curve right here. So you can think of this signal as representing how many exotons are still left, okay, where you're probing as a function of time. So at the beginning, um, you have no exotons. Everything is in the ground state. So you've got all this stuff in the ground state. As soon as you send your pump pulse, which happens right around here, where you've got this big spike, um, you populate this higher energy state, okay, so you have a few exotons that are hanging up there, and then as you wait, the longer you wait, fewer exotons are left, okay, because they've disappeared to other nether regions, uh, whether in time, energy, or space, okay, and, and then eventually um, you're back where you start again. Okay, so all of these traces um, tell you they encode all the information of the photosynthesis, okay. We call these population trends for what it's worth. Okay, so here's the problem with doing this. Some things about it are really good. Um, but normally, when people do these measurements, um, they look at a region that's, say, around 100 microns in diameter, which means that you could be averaging over a whole bunch of domains. If you imagine all these purple things are domains, you might be averaging over all of these things. Okay, So basically, anything that's <coughs> going on that's different in one region as opposed to another, you're just washing all of that out, okay? And this can be a big problem in order to get answers to the question of how the structure of the material is actually influencing the dynamics of these excitations, okay? So we want to uh, get around this problem and get kind of beneath the bulk, okay? So our idea in order to do this is to combine uh, ultrafast pump probe measurements with optical microscopy, okay? So basically, rather than probing regions that are this size, uh, we want to look at this tiny little region here. And if I blow that up a little bit, you're basically looking at a single domain, which should be entirely crystalline right here. And in the materials we're interested in studying, uh, the size of that is going to be anywhere from, say, like tens of microns to tens of nanometers. Okay? Um, and so the idea for our measurement is to basically divide that whole region up into a grid, okay? And we want to do the measurement, this probe measurement, at every pixel in this grid, okay? So if you look, for example, at this one spot that I've indicated with this red dot here, we're going to get uh, some place that looks like this, with an amplitude and a particular decay time. And we would expect that the ampl amplitude and the decay time are going to be different uh, depending on where we look. And that these can report on the dynamics of these expectations, okay? So just to give you a little flavor of this schematically, um, here are two different domains, and you can imagine probing here, uh, in this one on the left, or probing here in this one on the right, or probing at the boundary between the two, okay? And generating traces that look different in either case, okay? So here the amplitude is lower, here the signal is squished in, and the time constant is shorter. Okay, so that's the sort of thing um, that we want to do, looking pixel by pixel and looking at the difference between these different domains as a function of these parameters that we get from our signal. Okay, so in order to do this, um, we basically send these laser beams in to a microscope. Okay, so we have our pump beam and our probe beam, and we basically focus them down into the same region, the same little region in our film that we're trying to study. Um, this is the microscope that Kathy built in my lab, and we can scan the sample by moving the stage around here. This is a picture of the two objectives, one above and one 
get the show on the road is the following. Um, we wanted to prove that we could use the amplitude of our signal and the time constant of the decay of our signal as a sort of contrast agent. Can we get spatially resolved measurements um, that are uh, telling us something about the photophysics of these materials? Okay, so before we get carried away and also add in the sort of bonus of having exotons migrate, we deliberately put together a solution where the molecules are kind of disordered and not coupled to one another very strongly so that everything else can happen, but the exotons can't disappear. They're all either there where they were created or they disappear. Okay? Um, so we did this with a, a sample that had oxygen dye. Uh, sitting inside of uh, some sort of uh, polymer film matrix. Okay? Um, so you can think of this as, as basically being some sort of plastic in case of some dye molecules, except it's not done in a, an organized way that would be helpful to you for a solar cell. Okay? So just out of curiosity uh, to see um, who are still paying attention, you guys can answer this question too. Okay, so this is oxazine. Oxazine looks kind of blue. What color light do you think we have to illuminate it with when we do our experiments? Physics is feeling us now. Not blue. <laughs> Why not? Because it'll reflect a little blue. Okay, it's either going to reflect it or scatter it. So if it's not blue, then what do we have to choose from? Red. Yeah. So it actually absorbs red light. Okay, this is something that people get confused about all the time. So it's one of my favorite questions to ask. Okay, so we actually use red light in order to do this. And I keep on getting confused myself because my students keep on making all these different films with these different dyes in them. And they call them something, and then I look at them, and they're a different color than what they're called, and it's very confusing. So I'm getting a taste of my own best. Okay. So anyhow, um, this won't be on the fun list. <laughs> so, uh, anyhow, we've got these uh, films that have oxygen in them, and it's not evenly distributed. You have little droplets in some places and not in others. Okay, so we wanted to test out our methods on this. And it works. Okay, so here is the image that we were able to create where uh, the different colors that you're looking at here are telling you something about the amplitude of this photophysical signal that we're measuring. Okay, so it's not just like uh, looking at how much light gets absorbed, uh, is far more sophisticated than that. Uh, and you can see uh, these axes here. So like each of these individual pixels uh, represents about five microns by five microns. Okay, so I want to focus on this one spot over here where we've got this big blob of what looks to be oxygen. Okay, so this is what it looks like when we blow it up. And to kind of illustrate what we did, um, we basically took our measurements uh, with our laser beams parked at each of these locations. Okay, you can kind of see in the green stuff here, um, the signal is highest, okay, and it gets weaker as you move out towards the edges of this droplet. Okay, maybe it's easier to see uh, if I put everything here uh, in black. So basically, you're looking at the very beginning of each of these transients. That's what I have plotted here, where we've sent in our company and we're looking at about the first 100 or 200 picoseconds of dynamics that are going on. Okay, so you can start to see the signal rolling over a little bit. And we're interested in, say, comparing the amplitude here to the amplitude here to the amplitude here. So we're really excited because it looks like this works very nicely. The fact that we have a strong enough signal at each of these tiny little pixels that we can measure uh, differences uh, between these the photophysics in different locations. Okay? So we can do this with amplitude, and we can also do this by plotting not each of these traces, but by just plotting the amplitude itself, which is what this graph represents. Or we could do the same thing, but plot based on what these decay constants are uh, as well. Okay? So that was the first step, and we're really excited about it. This is the next step that Ben is praying for. Okay? So this is Ben prostrating himself in front of the microscope. <coughs> and the idea is that now that we want to put um, this exosphon transport back into the picture. Okay? So um, this is one of the films that Ben made, and it's a film of uh, a bunch of molecules like this um, that are crystallized. 
uh, in these various regions, so it's a mixture that I've been showing you a whole bunch of, and we're really excited to stick this film in the microscope now so that we can start understanding something about the migration of these exotons uh, over this kind of funny looking landscape right here. Okay. And um, I want to show you the sort of things that you might expect uh, in order to uh, be able to answer questions about the efficiency of organic solar cells. Um, so uh, let's do the same sort of thing as we just looked at with that data on this blob of oxygen dye, uh, but for looking at a particular uh, region that's heterogeneous here uh, in this film. Okay, so this is anticipated. Okay, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that all these beautiful traces are average data. Okay, these traces here uh, are just meant to illustrate some things that could happen. Uh, and from those things that could happen, we can try and infer uh, you know, what they happen and how we would want to structure materials uh, better, for example, in order to uh, make better solar cells, to make them more efficient. Okay, so you'll notice that they come in all different shapes and sizes. Try and highlight that. If you look at these blue traces right here, they correspond to boundaries between domains where maybe these boundaries act as little uh, electronic abysses. Okay, maybe exotons disappear at kin to these boundaries. Uh, and so we have very little uh, signature of them showing up anymore. Okay? Or uh, you could imagine looking at this one domain where you have uh, similar amplitudes all of these traces, but the widths are different. So this is really narrow right here, this is really wide right here, and that would be an indicator of how long exotons live in various regions. Okay, so just like if you go around the country, the life expectancy is different in different places. Um, the life expectancy of these exotons might be different in different places, and that tells us about some of the things that they're subjected to um, during their very, very short lifetimes. Okay? So you can do the same thing with all these different regions, and then ultimately what we want to be able to do is the same thing uh, that I showed you uh, two slides ago. Uh, we want to be able to compare all these different signals, compare the time constants, and compare the amplitudes in order to get information about uh, the process of exciton migration as a function of the structure of the material. Okay? So, this is going to be something that's really powerful because often people make these films and they make films that have the same composition, so like same molecules, but they have different properties when like people measure the efficiency of the solar cell. Nobody knows why. Okay? So by looking at this smaller light scale, we really think we'll be able to answer some of those questions and make sort of maps of where the excitons go or are as a function of time. So you can imagine, for example, we have some distribution that looks kind of like this at one instant, and then at another instant it looks like this. And based on that, uh, we can infer something about how the structure is determining how long they like to spend in certain places as opposed to others. Um, so what sort of things could go into influencing uh, this sort of uh, behavior? Well, the ones that we have kind of highest on our list are these ones that I'm pointing out here. Uh, so for one thing, we really want to investigate how the shape or size of these domains affects how far the exotons can go. So this is one of the first films that Ben made, and I use it because it's really pretty. But this one is super pretty because look how weird part of this here. Okay, so I really want to be able to compare the differences uh, in the photophysics as a function of space here and as a function of space here. So we want to know if these boundaries between domains are like corrals for the exotons. Um, we also are interested in looking at whether there's any sort of uh, dependence on space for the different decay processes. So for example, whether along these lines here, um, you have faster decay or if you have long skinny grains uh, or domains, does that act as a sort of channel to guide the energy to the right spot? Um, and also the initial composition, so what molecules you choose to make these things out of is going to be super important as well. Um, because all of the Coulomb interactions between the molecules that are holding them together in these crystalline geometries uh, it is really what's mediating the sort of electronic structure of the material. So where, how much energy the exotons have, how delocalized they are, how easily they 
up by looking uh, at other materials that are more disordered, that, that are often used, like for example, polymers, where we're going to need to use really small focal volumes in order to do that, way smaller than what we're working with right now. Uh, but we have some nifty ideas for defining, defining the optical diffraction limit using plasmonics so that we can make, say, tens of nanometer sized spots uh, for exciting our films. Um, we're also interested in doing the sorts of measurements in an entire solar cell. So we've been talking really about just one film, so like the donor material right here, but it would be very cool to see how that changes when we integrate the entire device. Uh, and in that thing, we're also interested in doing measurements where we combine optical probes with electrical probes. So I have a friend and collaborator, uh, Alex Weber Bargioni at LDL, uh, just up the hill, and he likes doing conductive atomic force microscopy. So he wants to use this really sharp tip here as an electrode uh, for the solar cell so that we can map where the electrons go as a function of space, not only the excitons. So these are all different directions that we're excited about heading uh, in the future. Um, but what I really hope that I convinced you of this afternoon is that we're well on our way to really getting on the bus uh, in order to explore how the structure of these molecular materials allows these excitations to surf on them, how it works better in some contexts than others. And now when you go to San Francisco and you're waiting for the bus yourself, uh, you know that these are plastic solar cells that are sitting over here, that inside they look something like this, and that if you dig down even deeper, they look like this, and that this particular structure is what's determining all of the properties that allow them to be deployed here. Okay, so our trick that we want to bring to this problem is this optical microscopy element, uh, which isn't something that's ever been combined before with measuring these fast dynamics at which the exotons migrate. Uh, and I'm really excited. Uh, hopefully, in a few years, I'll be able to show, tell you more about the continuation of this project. I'm really excited to see uh, how it's going to end up. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
how efficient are those materials in that shelter that you show there compared to what would be optimally happen if you design the perfect medium? Okay, so if you just, I mean, the sort of benchmark that people talk about for the perfect uh, photovoltaic device is uh, an efficiency of about 40%, uh, and that's sort of like a thermodynamic limit. Um, and that is something that people are approaching in materials like silicon. Um, in these, the efficiency is much lower. It's probably less than 10%. Um, but the advantage is that the amount of energy that goes into making them is lower. The ease with which you can just like print them out and mass produce them is um, much higher. So they're also very tunable, so you can collect all different parts of the spectrum. So this thing looks red, but you can overlay red, green, and blue ones so that you're collecting more of the light and so forth. Well, since, <coughs> since in nature, the photosynthesis has a pretty high efficiency. Does that mean 98%? Or? So the efficiency for the exoton migration in photosynthesis is, is yeah, it's basically somewhere between 90 and 95 percent. And what I mean for that, it's not that we can produce biomass that, like, in the chemical bonds, uh, you know, has 100 percent of the energy of the light that was illuminating. Uh, hopefully, um, but this exoton migration process, where for every photon absorbed you have charge separation, that's what's nearly um, like 100 percent efficient. So we don't have any clue how to do that with a or a woman <laughs> So I don't know if there's any sort of gender difference there. But, but, uh, but, but that's one of the reasons that in my lab we're interested in studying how this works in photosynthesis as well. Because you see all this crystalline stuff here in these materials, and that's the way to presumably get good efficiency in organic photovoltaics. But in photosynthesis, the chlorophyll molecules that do this work are arranged in all these different directions. They look completely random. And yet, that random arrangement is doing the right thing. So we want to look at that and see why it's good, and look at these and see how we can make it better, basically, to see where, where the two can match up. I thought they had a, a different the antenna structure to concentrate. Yeah, the so they do, they do have an antenna sort of structure, which means you have a bunch of chlorophylls that are kind of like in the sort of exterior region, and then rather than having an interface between two bulk materials, you have a particular protein that has chlorophylls in it whose job it is to separate these charges and sequester the electron in the hole. Um, so all those molecules that surround this one protein have to do that, what we call an antenna. Um, but the fundamental idea of like how it works is compared to so in a sense you're trying to study that sort of an antenna effect. Yeah, uh, I guess you could think of it like that. We're basically trying to see how all of this light energy that gets absorbed is found <coughs> to particular locations, why it's funneled to some places rather than others, or what's preventing it from getting where it wants to go, or where we want to go. Two questions. Uh, uh, why do the electrons, once they're separated, they get across that thing, why do they bother going up to the different planes? Oh, the well, they, they kind of get stuck there <laughs> by a potential. So you, well, have to, so you have to put some um, like voltage across the device. Um, so even like when it's when it's not operating as a closed circuit, it, it, does it does take energy, but you get more energy out of okay. putting it. Yeah, so basically there's a potential that's, that's sucking them up, except that they still want to do their own thing and kind of migrate around. Um, so they don't all get there. Yeah, it's kind of intuitive to me. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then, and then your diagram was the, was the light that comes down. I don't know if you want to go back to it. You, you, you got this little guy, and then the light's coming this way through the hole, and then. Oh, the no, it's going the other way. So you, oh, you're talking about this pump probe. Oh, so basically, the uh, light pulses are both going oh, uh, kind of towards okay. the back of my oh. slide. And then the hole that you saw was basically a way to filter out so we measure only the probe light oh. and not the pump light. Okay, so the, 
There's pro-right wing fluid, there's pump right wing fluid, and it's actually going to hit the same spot on the top yeah. on the car. That's essential. Mm -hmm. But then, and then one's blocked by the backup, the one goes yeah. through the hole, and then this is a receiving device. Exactly. Okay, and these arrows, okay. I thought too, arrows. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, would your microscope support any sort of angle of attack or But 
one is a whole new thing to do. Is it like you're transferring the electrons of atoms? Yeah, it's basically like, like some like void is pushing other electrons out of the way. Okay, so you can kind of think of it as you know the fact that electrons have to move out of the way as being like what's generating. Rush hour traffic.